uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you. So I thought after some, uh, some terrific presentations on uh, the future of, of automotive and mobility, uh, we would give you our top-down perspective of how we at City Research view both the car of the future and mobility of the future. I'll skip this through some slides that some of my colleagues already covered, uh, but I think this quote really is a good way to start because we really couldn't agree more with some of the changes that are happening in automotive. And you've heard a lot about the technology side of things uh, and some of the incredible advances in areas like uh, computer power, uh, deep learning, uh, machine vision, and so many of the, the other technologies out there. But when we think about it more from a, a top-down view, I think if we had to summarize why this is all happening, one of the, the reasons that's often not really discussed is that a lot of interests today in automotive are being aligned much more perfectly. It used to be that regulatory um, decisions and, and rules used to drive technology innovation by and large within the auto industry. Today, it's being driven by an alignment of interest both from regulations on fuel efficiency, emissions, safety, as well as the consumer actually wanting these technologies and the payback in current terms not only of safety, but of convenience and content that the consumer will enjoy that we think will help accelerate the, the innovations in the industry. And there's a lot going on. You've heard all about it uh, uh, this afternoon. If we had to just summarize really the, the three mega trends that we focus on the most, I, th I think there's just really three core ones that some of my, uh, the earlier speakers touched upon. The first, I think most powerful is in fact automated driving. And I couldn't agree more with my colleagues that it will occur in steps but we think it's gonna actually occur faster than people believe. We think that there's a huge amount of interest in the automotive industry to pursue automated driving because automated driving knocks a lot of birds with a single stone. Think about making the cars a lot safer. Think about selling services to the consumers for automated driving, not just at the time of sale as an option, which often leads to very low penetration levels for many years uh, in the early onset of any technology, but selling services through connected cars, through software updates, um, that, that will, of course, can, can be, again, aligning the interests of the automakers and their profit interests with what the consumers want and are willing to pay for and what the regulators want, both in terms of fuel efficiency and safety. And speaking of, of fuel efficiency, people often, often think about automated driving as a mode of fuel efficiency, but as we do reduce the number of vehicles on the road longer term, as we can uh, lean towards more responsible driving, more fuel efficient driving habits, this is very, very powerful because it really does hit in, on all of those uh, metrics. By 2018, we think you will start to see uh, a lot of vehicles with fuller automated capabilities. This would be the level three uh, that was described before for those who are paying attention. But in 2020, we think that the era of driverless vehicles will begin. Now, when we say the era begins in automotive, it's not like smartphones where everybody starts to have them within a year or two. It is a very slow process. We think, and, we, and we'll show a model uh, on this in a few minutes, um, the process could actually begin, at least in the US, in major cities that are very much, uh, will be prone to these very uh, unique business models of robotic uh, taxi vehicles, uh, warmer cities perhaps where electric vehicles tend to operate better, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The second trend, of course, is vehicle electrification, and not just only because of the, the, uh, the emissions uh, power of, of electrified vehicles, both from uh, you know, 48 volts, hybridization, and, and, and plug-in and full electric vehicles, but also from the fact that, again, the interests being aligned with consumers who can enjoy uh, very fun to drive electric vehicles that have very good torque dynamics, as well as the lower operating costs of the electric vehicle uh, per mile relative to gasoline. So we think over the next five or 10 years, um, you will start to see electric vehicles and battery costs start to make the, the electric vehicle very cost competitive at the onset relative to internal combustion. That really could lead to uh, not only you know, of course, higher uh, penetration of electric vehicles around the world, but, but also for the consumer, again, that payback in terms of a lower operating cost and a more enjoyable driving experience. And the last really trend that, that, that um, uh, puts it all together is connectivity. Uh, connect connected cars, both for selling services, doing over-the-air software updates, again, reducing miles driven, saving uh, costs for the automakers, uh, and really turning the automobile into the what some describe, and I, and I agree with, is the ultimate wearable device. So think about the time spent in, in the car and the value to the different industry players of your time in that hour or two per day that you spend in your car. When that car is driving autonomously, uh, the capability of selling you services, of learning more about you, of turning that vehicle into almost a social device. And so this will be enabled a lot through connectivity uh, in automated vehicles. Now, um, I'll skip through some, some of these because it was already uh, uh, captured. But actually, I'll show one slide here because we have seen this movie before uh, in, in automotive that when you do put together affordable technologies 
uh, sensors like cameras and radars with very powerful software that can save lives and offer convenience, the penetration does tend to be fairly fast. Again, th this is actually fast in automotive from 1995 to, to 2010 for electronic stability control. Uh, but we think with connectivity, the penetration of some of the newer technologies, particularly with an automated driving, can actually even happen faster than this. So the combination of aligning interest in automotive really can lead to some profound changes. Um, I'll skip through some of these. This is another important chart. It was touched upon before. But the key here with automated vehicles is not only that they uh, make the vehicle safer, but they provide convenience features that consumers are willing to pay significant money for. And this is all, in automotive a very, very key uh, figure because automakers are only going to really invest in technology that they believe they can earn a return on given that it is generally a lower margin business. Um, and, and of course, we talked about this a little bit before, but um, once you have connectivity and you're able to sell services to the consumers directly in the car. So today, think about the way you buy a car. The automaker has to guess which options and features you want. Think about how, you know, in an innovation conference, how lack of, of, of innovation th th this whole concept is, where the automaker has to build cars tomorrow guessing what you want. You walk into the dealership not really knowing everything you might want. I mean, how many people really know what traffic jam assist, adaptive cruise control features really are? much less uh, fully you know, automated highway piloting. With connectivity, the guesswork that the, both the consumer and automaker have to make kind of goes away because they can sell you a vehicle with sensors already in place that will perform safety for you throughout the life of the vehicle. And then if you want the convenience software for automated driving later on, or if I buy your car after five years in the secondary market and I want those features, I could be, buy it the way we buy apps on, on our phone. And again, this is a, a potential major profit driver for the, the auto industry that we think will accelerate um, innovation in, in the car of the future. Now, um, insurance savings, another potential very, very powerful impact. We talked about before aligning interests and offering the consumers <coughs> ultimately not just a fun, safer experience, but also a payback on what they're being asked to pay. You know, we estimate in the next several years the cost of a not level four automated driverless car, but level three, three and a half, very highly autonomous car in terms of the cost of the automakers could come down to about $1,500. Uh, think about the cameras, radars, and various sensors around the vehicle that you see here. By US numbers, if you offer me a 15, one five percent insurance discount to accept uh, you know, this highly automated car, which is of course a safe car, a much safer car, tw uh, 365, 24 uh, hours of the day, uh, all year round, that 15% will fund the vast majority of the cost of the $1,500 in terms of my monthly payment uh, under a, a typical US auto loan uh, term. So what does that mean? That eventually the car companies may be able to sell you an autonomous capable car meaning the, the options, the features, for free, essentially for free. And then, and then if you wanna buy various a la carte features for automated driving, you'll be able to do that uh, separately through an over the air uh, update feed. And of course, over the longer term, the, the payback to the auto industry for accelerating this change uh, is dramatic. Think about cars that don't crash. And this is of course, of course a very, very long term, but think about cars that don't crash and what you can do in terms of taking out content in the car, uh, building the cars differently, that will also save costs and, and start to you know, rethink the way we think about mobility in the future. So, so the, the return attributes to the whole industry are very, very powerful in this trend. Now, one of the topics uh, that I think was raised before is what will happen to personal car ownership when we start to enter the driverless car era? Now, thankfully at City, we've been actually studying this trend for over five years with a survey that we've gone out to uh, thousands of consumers a few times a year over the past five years. And we've asked consumers in the US three basic questions. We've asked them, how many cars per household do you have today? Thinking ahead, how many cars per household do you expect you'll have two years from today? And the third question we asked them is why? So we've amassed major data over the past five years to really study this trend. So we do think as we get into 2020 and beyond in the, in the era of driverless mobility, there's two realities that, that, that the industry will have to accept. First is that the the business model around driverless mobility is highly compelling. Even before you think about what you can do with the data in the vehicle and the ecosystem around the consumer <coughs> and that wearable mobility device in, 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 in that driverless vehicle. But you also have, we think, two new forms of automobile. What we call the Perso AV, the personal autonomous vehicle, which I still own, but it has driverless capability, perhaps in, in certain conditions under certain speeds. So if I drive to work, 
and I park that vehicle, why won't I loan that vehicle while I'm at work to maybe a driverless mobility network? I can earn some extra cash to maybe fund some more technology, and therefore we can actually reduce congestion, reduce the number of vehicles on the road, perhaps reduce the number of, of taxis or even rental uh, a car, um, run a car or cars on the road, yet I still have that freedom to drive when I want to and have a sensor that provides me safety. So this is gonna be a very, very slow but disruptive change that we think will begin in the next decade. So going back to our study around mobility, um, so far in our survey work, we have not yet seen, and I'll just skip a couple slides, any <coughs> real um, change in behavior from car sharing. I mean, when we ask consumers why they're going to have more or fewer or the same number of cars per household in two years than they do, uh, when we survey them, uh, they still tend to cite mostly financial reasons. They haven't actually come to us and said, yes, it's because now I can, I can share a car. One of the conundrums here is if you think about where driverless mobility networks are going, going to be most profitable, it's obviously gonna be in the high <coughs> dense cities uh, around the world. Yet in high dense cities, they also have higher uh, income earners that like to own their personal cars to begin with. So here's a fun stat for you. Over 50% of riders in New York City taxis actually own a car. So will they actually switch or not? Our survey will be really interesting to follow this over time, but so far we have not yet seen that trend. But what if we start to see this um, emerge, um, as I mentioned before, this driverless mobility network industry emerge in some of the US's major cities, and we do start to assume some declines in personal car density. Um, if we run this math, and I won't bore you with all the mathematics we can talk about in the Q&A, we do think by 2030 you could start to see maybe about a million to, to two million unit decline in uh, U.S. auto sales for new vehicles, which uh, you know, will likely make, we think, for a very gradual shift for, to lower uh, sales, but of course, higher uh, profit per vehicle. So it's slow, but you do start to see the profound changes here. And of course, this does have implications for uh, emissions uh, and, and congestion that will start to happen. But I'll leave you with one final note in the interest of time here. Uh, and of course, there are many, many players, and we could talk about the industry landscapes uh, here. But when we think about what's happening and the opportunity for the automotive industry from innovation globally, you think about the car today. The car today is actually fairly underpenetrated. Many of what we call the frontier markets that are highly populated yet still growing. Think about India, Indonesia, Nigeria. And look at the car density around the world where, where the US is, uh, where Japan is relative to these regions. One of the problems in automotive today is that traditionally in history, any country has to, would have to achieve a certain GDP per capita threshold to start to enter into the discussion of, of personal car ownership because you need, of course, high affordability for big ticket items, infrastructure dealers, and all of the above. But we think in the very long term about what driverless mobility can start to do in reducing the barrier to enter into personal mobility, shared mobility. Uh, we did a study this summer that looked into some of these frontier markets, uh, particularly India, Indonesia, and, and Nigeria, based on cities' long-term growth, uh, economic growth forecast. And we came up with an estimate that you could unlock over 8 million units of additional demand for whatever you want to call these automobiles, pods, driverless. Uh, and they don't necessarily be fully driverless uh, either, or even fully electric. But you do start to lower the cost um, to, to play in automotive, which could have I think, some very profound implications uh, for, for people around, around the world. Because ultimately what's happening here, beyond everything I've already talked about, is when you think about electric, autonomous, connected mobility, uh, it does ultimately have the real potential of reducing the cost of personal ownership as well as the cost of entering into the mobility space uh, in general. Uh, so thank you for having me. I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions.